This video provides an overview of the Isaac architecture. For more details, please do check out our full paper at ISCA 2016. So, thanks to Moore's Law Scaling, general purpose processors have seen dramatic improvements in the last three decades. But as Moore's Law Scaling starts to taper off, researchers have turned to accelerators. Accelerators can provide large performance jumps for next generation systems, but this is only true for specific workloads. And one of those important workload classes is that of machine learning. Machine learning forms the basis for several big data, image, and speech algorithms, and it will be critical in future breakthroughs. For example, it may be used for vision in self-driving cars, for speech in mobile devices, and for medical diagnosis in data centers. In this video, we will lay out the design for a non-traditional accelerator that works especially well on large machine learning algorithms. For example, deep neural networks. And why is this architecture non-traditional? It is because it uses an analog unit to perform the math. And this approach is worth exploring because new devices have made it possible to design an analog unit that can very efficiently perform dot product computations. And these dot products are the bulk of the computation in deep networks. But analog units have baggage. They're not always precise and they require high overhead analog to digital conversion. So the key to designing an efficient accelerator is to manage both of these challenges. So I'll start by first describing the basic analog unit that efficiently performs dot products. I'll then describe the challenges with this unit and how we can overcome these challenges by reorganizing the data layout and the computation. I'll then describe the Isaac architecture and its unique pipeline that ensures that every unit is busy cranking away in every single cycle. And then I'll finally end with a brief summary of results. Note that in this talk, I'll focus on already trained deep networks that take an image as input and perform image classification. For example, as might be done at least every millisecond in a self-driving car. So let's start with the design of an analog unit that performs dot products. Consider the simple circuit here with three wires and two resistors. Assume that the two resistors have conductance values of G1 and G2. If I apply voltages V1 and V2 at these two wires, the first wire injects a current V1 times G1 into this vertical wire called a bit line. And the second wire similarly injects a current V2 times G2 into the bit line. And these currents add up to give a total current value of V1 times G1 plus V2 times G2. Thus, the resulting current in this bit line is simply the dot product of the input vector of voltages and the vector of conductances. And all we are doing here is relying on Kirchhoff's law to perform the multiplications and additions in the analog domain. We didn't need any complex digital ALUs to perform multiplies and adds. I can extend this concept further and create this dense grid of resistances. I can program the resistances beforehand. That gives me this matrix of conductances G. And now when I apply a vector of voltages as input, the current in each vertical line or bit line is the dot product of the input voltage vector and the vector of resident conductances in that column. So the currents coming from the bit lines are the result of a vector matrix multiplication which is the bulk of all the computations done in a deep neural network. This grid of resistances is called a crossbar. Each crossbar can be implemented as a memristor material that is sandwiched between overlapping horizontal and vertical wires on two metal layers. And several technology innovations in recent years have enabled the design of dense memristor crossbars that can precisely perform large parallel dot products in the analog domain. So this is quite magical. I provide inputs on the left and in parallel several neurons over here are doing all of their necessary math with this natural summation of currents. But there is a problem. My outputs are showing up as analog current values 
and for many reasons the analog value has to be converted into a digital value. This allows me to buffer the result, it allows me to send that result over long wires and it prevents errors from accumulating. And this conversion is done with an analog to digital converter or an ADC which is a non-trivial circuit with high power and area overheads. And this overhead grows almost exponentially with the number of digital bits being produced by that ADC. That is, if the ADC produces an 8-bit digital result, its overhead is nearly twice that of an ADC that produces a 7-bit digital result. Now, let's assume that similar to many prior works in this area, my deep network is working with 16-bit fixed-point numbers. So the input analog voltage over here represents a 16-bit digital value. And the analog conductance of the cell over here also represents a 16-bit value. Multiplying the voltage and the conductance therefore gives me a 32-bit result. And adding up these products over 1024 rows gives me a final value that could require 42 bits to represent. That is, I would need a very large ADC with 42-bit resolution to extract the final result of this computation. So this example is illustrative of the fact that the ADC requirements go up dramatically if I design a naive dot product crossbar. Now arbitrarily dropping these bits with a low resolution ADC can introduce error that can accumulate across a many layer deep network. And therefore the Isaac architecture is designed to never drop bits and faithfully reproduce the results of a software implementation of 16-bit fixed-point arithmetic. The ADC overheads are kept in check by distributing a single computation across time, across multiple columns in a crossbar, and across multiple crossbars. And we also use an encoding trick to further bring down the ADC resolution. And so let's look at each one of these in turn. The 16-bit input voltage is provided as 16 1-bit input voltages. So this is being provided sequentially as 1-bit values over 16 cycles. And this results in a simple digital to analog converter for inputs and it lowers the ADC resolution. Secondly, the 16-bit weight is spread across 8 2-bit cells. So a single 16-bit value is spread across 8 different columns where each column accommodates a 2-bit value. And this 2-bit cell places a much lower demand on ADC resolution and it simplifies the write circuitry relative to, let's say, a 5-bit cell. A single crossbar is also implemented with only 128 rows and this helps limit the maximum output current from a column. So if you have a neuron which needs more than 128 inputs, then it has to be spread across multiple of these circuits across multiple crossbars. So with these parameters, with a 1-bit input, with a 2-bit cell, and with 128 rows, you would need a 9-bit ADC at the bottom to capture the resulting dot product value and not drop any bits. If we try to increase any of these parameters to increase either computational or storage density, the ADC resolution would correspondingly also have to increase. And unfortunately, that overhead grows almost exponentially. To further reduce the ADC requirement, we encode the weights. So take this example. If all the weights were their max value of 3, and this is done for 128 rows, you would eventually get a sum of 384, which, as discussed before, requires a 9-bit ADC. So in such cases, when the sum is large, we store each 2-bit weight in its flip form. That is, in this example, if you had to store a 3, you would instead store a 0. And so in this example, you'd store a bunch of zeros. And so by storing the weights in either their original form or in their flipped form, we guarantee that the resulting dot product never exceeds half the maximum value, that is, it never exceeds 192. And this allows us to bring the ADC resolution down from 9 bits to 8 bits. 
and the seemingly simple change can reduce total chip power by 1.5x and that's because the ADCs are such high overhead. In addition, our encoding can seamlessly handle sign values for both inputs and weights and please check out the full paper for more details on that encoding. Now even with all of these attempts to reduce ADC resolution, the ADC continues to account for about 58% of chip power and 31% of chip area. And this highlights the importance of each one of these techniques. Now, the downside of doing this is that a single neuron computation is spread across multiple crossbars. It is spread across multiple columns in a crossbar and across multiple cycles. And so the final neuron value must therefore aggregate digitized partial sums from multiple crossbars, multiple columns, and multiple cycles. And this is performed with simple digital shift and add units that account for a negligible fraction of total chip power and total chip area. So in this first video, we've discussed the basic analog crossbar unit and how ADC overheads can be managed. In the next video, we'll describe the overall ISAAC architecture and its results.